about the atmosphere is still thick. I had planned a very lengthy introduction and I know that he was not going to like it. But I feel Reverend Emiko needs to come up right now. So God's general.
Hallelujah. 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 We worship you, Father. We magnify you, Lord. We magnify you, Lord. We magnify you, Lord. We testify that you alone are God. We testify that you alone are God. There is none else beside you. There is none else beside you. You alone are God. Precious Holy Spirit, have your way. Visit our gathering this moment. Let Jesus be glorified. Let your presence be experienced. Let our life be equipped and edified of fellowship with you and service for you to the glory of your name. We thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen, 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 amen. Wow, you may be seated, please. You may be seated, please. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah. Beloved, um, one, of the, one of the things we must, we must learn, one of the things we must treasure in this hour is how to treasure, cultivate, nurture, special manifestations of the Holy Spirit in our midst. It's something we must learn in this hour. How to nurture, treasure, cultivate, contain special manifestations of the Spirit of God in our midst. My dear friends, it it would have been spiritually injurious, spiritually highly offensive, spiritually criminal for there to be that type of manifestation of his presence that he granted us a while ago. Yeah? And then we, we truncate that to introduce some who. We truncate that to introduce who. Somebody explain to me. Why? Huh? Why? That means we are saying to the Lord, we've had enough of you. Enough of you. Let's um, bring in somebody who is more important than you. God forbid that I'm that type of person. God forbid that I'm that type of person. That I'm that person. <laughs> oh, Lord, have mercy on my soul. My dear friends, what I'm saying to you in reality is this. Whatever you had planned before, whatever you had planned before, you must be sensitive to the mood of the moment. Do you understand what I'm saying? You must be sensitive to the mood of the moment. That is how you experience greater manifestations, experiences with the Holy Spirit. When you learn to, to treasure his presence. You understand what I'm saying? Please, 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 hear me. Please. God is bigger than any one of us. He is more to be treasured than any one of us. Do you understand me? One of my biggest treasures in life, one of my biggest blessings in life, is that I have learned from an early stage to treasure the presence of the Holy Spirit. I've learned it from an early stage. Right? 
I learned it from an early stage, and it's been a huge blessing to me. <laughs> All those ladies, people who were screaming, why were you screaming? Why were you screaming? Is it because you wanted to scream? Huh? Is it because you were crazy? There was some experience. There was some encounter you were going through. And you were expressing it. In that expression, you were screaming. In that screaming, you forgot about your personality. You forgot about how you will look in the eyes of people. And you gave vent to the visitation of the Holy Spirit upon your life. You gave vent to it. You gave expression to it. It didn't matter who was looking. It didn't matter who thought what. In simple language, you treasured him over your own personality. Those are the kinds of people that God is looking for. Those are the kinds of people that God is going to do great things with. Are you following me? People that treasure his presence. People that treasure his person. That treasure his person more than their personality. <laughs> Look, you guys haven't seen anything, no. I'm a very noisy listener. I'm a very noisy person. When I'm in church, I worship at Christ Chapel in Ibadan. That's where I worship. A lot of times, I'm not around because I've traveled meetings, yeah? But when I'm around, the people will tell me after church, ah, Reverend, we knew you had come. We knew. Because when the word of God is good, listen, in those days, in the, in the early, late 70s, early 80s, at Kenneth Higgins uh, camp meetings in Tulsa. <laughs> After some special meetings, some people will come and meet me and either give me money or give me some gifts. Some will pull up their watch and give me. They said, brother, we were, we were blessed just watching you enjoying the word of God. We were blessed. <laughs> we were blessed just watching you enjoying the word of God. These days, it has gotten wild. These days, it has gotten wild. Friends, many times you have to make a decision. What do I treasure more? What I look like in the eyes of people or my fellowship with the Holy Spirit. You have to decide which one is more important to you. There are a lot of people who, because of how they think they look, the Spirit of God is visiting them, but they put a cap on it. They don't want to respond to it because they say in their minds, what will I look like? What will people say about me? What will people say about me? May God deliver every one of us from that. May God deliver. I'm saying in simple language, after that wonderful time of fellowship with the Holy Spirit and he showing up so powerfully in our midst, it would have been spiritually damaging for Polu to start introducing one who. Who is that person? Huh? Who is that person? You know what? When we do those kinds of things, we truncate the flow of the spirit. We truncate it. We, we truncate it. 
will truncate it. So please, please, if you are ever in charge of any meeting, make sure you protect the presence of the Holy Spirit over and above <laughs> any man. If the minister is stupid enough to be offended with you, if the minister is stupid enough to be offended with you that you did not introduce him well, let him be offended. And you know that a lot of us ministers do a lot of stupid things. We do a lot of stupid things. I'm hoping, I'm, I hope that you people that sit on the pew will work with God so much, so much that when a minister of God is doing something stupid, you know that this man is being stupid. Even though he's supposed to be a, a, a minister of God, but this one, he had no correct. There are many of us ministers like that. Many of us ministers are like that because we are spiritually shallow. We are spiritually empty. <laughs> Do you understand me? I was at the minister's conference last year. I believe it is last year. Yes, in the Gondo area. And the meeting was going on. <laughs> and and um, at some point, I was trying to make a distinction between the anointing and spirituality. And I said that anointing and spirituality are two separate things. They are two different things. I said a man can be anointed, but yet very carnal. That I actually preached a message sometime entitled anointed but carnal. I said, anointing is a divine enablement, okay? The anointing is a, it is a divine enablement that comes on you from God, okay? It is external to you. It is external. It does not originate in you. It comes upon you from God to enable you accomplish an assignment for him. That's what the anointed is. It is external to you. It does not originate in you. It does not reside in you as such. It is external. It comes upon you to enable you carry out an assignment for God. That's it. I said that spirituality Spirituality is something you cultivate out of your daily walk with God. Spirituality is something you cultivate out of your daily walk with God. Spirituality does not come on you. It is something you cultivate. You seek God. You pursue him. You surrender your heart to him. You open up your life to him. Your surrender to him creates room in you for him to occupy. Your surrender to him creates room in you, in your heart, in your life, for him to fill, for him to occupy. I said those are anointed and spirituality are two different things. I said... Nigeria is full of anointed preachers, but very carnal Christians. So look for them outside of the pulpit. Look for them outside of the pulpit. It's a difference. So I was going on and on in that way. And I said, I said, for instance, there are some people when they come into a meeting and they are not well introduced. They will get angry and blow their top. 
blow their top because they were not well introduced. I was just, I was just preaching along. I was just saying that, right? After the meeting, after the meeting, the wife of the convener, while we were eating lunch in the back, the wife of the convener came to me. She said, Reverend, I fear this God. Oh. She said, Reverend, I, fe I fear this God. Oh. I fear this our God. Sir, when you were saying all those things about people who were they are not, when they are not introduced, they will blow their top. Sir, when you were saying those things, you were standing in front of this man and his wife, and that's their life. <laughs> you were standing in front of this man and his wife, and that is their life you were describing. <laughs> he said, as a matter of fact, a few months ago, they came in late to a meeting. The meeting had already, was already going on. So they were not introduced. They made so much wahala. We had to go to their house to beg them. We had to go to their house to... to <laughs> so I'm saying that to you. For you to know, not everybody who stands on the pulpit is a spiritual person. Are you following me? I'm not asking you but to now begin to judge, now begin to judge people. Oh, if you get into that ministry, you might be creating problems for yourself. Oh. Just remain neutral, right? But study the word of God, follow the Holy Spirit, and just live your life. When you see anything that is not supposed to be in your heart, know that this is not supposed to be. Right? Yes, and just, just live your life. So, I'm saying, please, it's important for, there is too much of um, fear of man in the body of Christ today. There is too much of it, fear of we have become so afraid of man that we fear men more than we fear God. And that shouldn't be so. That should not be so. Do you understand me? That should not be so. That ought not to be so. Anyway, where I'm going in my time with you this afternoon, some three very simple things I want to mention to you. Very, very simple, very ordinary, but please take them serious. Take, take them serious, take them serious. Take them serious. Number one, number one, number one, cultivate a deep personal walk with God. Cultivate a deep personal walk with God. Cultivate a deep, deep personal walk with God. Cultivate a deep personal walk with God. Friends, your Christianity, your Christianity must go beyond just coming to church and um, we were singing, everywhere is fun, we are all, Christianity is more than that. Christianity is a personal walk with God. A personal walk with God. Take your personal walk with God very seriously. Do you understand? Take your personal walk with God. And what that means is that on a regular basis, on a regular basis, in your privacy, in your room, wherever it is, your heart must cry out to God continuously to say, Lord, I want my life to please you. I want my life to honor you. Lord, I want my heart. I want my heart. Friends, the reason I take it to that level, 
you know, we can say anything on our lips. We can say anything on our lips. Anybody can say anything. It is what your heart is saying. That is what matters most to God. You know, the Bible says, man looketh on the outside, but God looketh on the inside. Your heart, your heart must continuously cry out to God. Lord, I want my life to honor you. I want my life to honor you. I want my heart to honor you. I want my life to please you. That is to say that the primary thing you are living for, the primary thing you are living for as a believer is to please God, to honor God, to seek him, to know him, to love him, and to honor him. To walk in his will. Walk in his purpose. Friends, this is the core of Christianity. This is the core. This is the root. That is where it begins and ends. A heart surrendered to God. A heart that is surrendered to God. That is not something you do once in a meeting. No, it is a continuous thing that you must do in your life. It is something that you must continuously do in your life. It is something <coughs> Where's my water? Is it it? It is something you must continuously do in your life. Okay? That is something you must continuously do. To continuously come before God. To continuously come before God. In the quiet moments of your life. To pour out your heart to him. To say, Lord, I want my heart. I want my life to honor you. I want my life to please you. I want my heart to honor you. Help me. Show me. Teach me. Friends, that is something you must be engaged in all of your life. All of your life as a believer. If that is your primary pursuit, hear me, if that is your primary pursuit in life, if that is the primary thing that your heart is engaged in, right? That pursuit, that hunger for God, right? It will, it will direct the way Everything else goes in your life. It will direct and influence the way everything else goes in your life. That surrender. My dear friends, I'm talking to you about this because not much is being said about this in Christianity today, particularly amongst our Pentecostal community, not much is being said about 
commitment, surrender to God. There are people in church, there are people in church But outside of church, they are a different person. They are a different person. They have one life while in church. They have another life outside of church. (laughs) Friends, wherever you are, God is watching. Wherever you are, God is watching watching over your life. A very close friend of mine, a brother, my very close friend, he was, um, he, he resigned from NNPC in anger. He was executive director. He was executive director NNPC for refining and petrochemicals. That was a position he held. And he, he, he resigned in anger. He left the job. Because, <laughs> are you ready to hear this? By his responsibility, he was supposed to get, it's okay, you can leave it there. By his responsibility in his office, he was supposed to get the refineries back into operation. Right? Because he was executive director of refining and petrochemicals. He got some of the refineries working, but he could not find crude oil in Nigeria to pump to the refineries to refine, to produce petrol. He could not find. He could not find crude oil within Nigeria to pump to the refineries for them to refine and produce petrol. He could not. Because the politicians had decided that refineries must not function to to produce PMS. They will fund the elections with imported fuel. When he got to that level, he just got angry and resigned. And in resigning like that, he was walking away from millions of naira. Do you understand? His rent as executive director, when he was living in a rented accommodation, he was paying 11 million naira for rent. That tells you he was loaded. Yeah? But he walked away from that. He walked away from that. When he was the MD of the refinery in Port Harcourt, when he came in, somebody was removed. The former MD was removed and he was brought in. Yeah? When he came in, there was a contract that the former MD had approved in principle. He, but he just had not signed. Okay? He had not signed it, but he had approved it in principle. The outside contractor had signed, but the MD had, had approved in principle. Then he was removed, and my friend was brought in. When he looked over this supposed contract, the outside contractor, they were going to end up stealing over 100,000 barrels of crude oil from Nigeria, and government was going to pay them <laughs> for that. So, he refused to sign. He said, no, I cannot sign this. You know what? The outside contractor, they came to him with one million dollars cash. One million dollars cash for him to sign. One million Dollars. Cash. He said, I'm sorry, I don't do such things. 
I don't do such things. I don't do such things. The people were shocked. They were shocked. Who is that person in Nigeria that we will offer one million dollars? Dollars! Cash. That will turn it down. So they now began to make inquiries. Ah, who is this person? Who is this person? Then they found out, oh, he's one of these church people. He's one of these church people. Oh, okay. So they came back to him with the money. They said, take the money and go and do the work of God. <laughs> go and do the work of God. All the missionary work. Take it and go and do the work of God. He said, I'm sorry, I don't do such things. And my friend, I want to ask you, how much is your Christianity worth? How much? How much is your Christianity worth? How much will you see? How much money will they dangle before you? And you will say, God, please excuse me for now. Please just leave me for now. Excuse me, Lord. I'll see you later. Friends, how, how much is your Christianity worth? It is this continuous surrender, opening up your heart to the Lord on a continuous basis. That's what will hold you up at such times. Do you understand me? That is what is going to hold you up at such times. That's what is going to hold you up. That is what is going to hold you up your continuous emptying of your heart before God. Lord, I want my heart to please you. I want my heart to honor you from my heart. Not my lips. My heart. My heart. My heart. I went to England for the first time in 1975. I was a much younger person then. 1975, I went to attend uh, a conference of the Fountain Trust, one of the main charismatic fellowships in England. I went to attend their conference. And um, I was staying with my sister at Cambridge. She was doing her residency then in Adam Brooks Hospital. And everywhere I turned, everywhere I went, on the streets, in Cambridge, in, in London, everywhere I turned. Well, you know what I found? Come on, my brother. Everywhere I turned, everywhere, everywhere I turned. On the streets, on the train, you know what I found? A boy and a girl. On the streets, on the train, sit down. Thank you. On the train, as soon as they got into the train, sat down, they were in each other's arms. Like that. At that time, I was the head of the Christian Fellowship on the campus of the University of Ibadan, Ibadan Varsity Christian Union. That was the main Christian fellowship on campus. I was the president in 1975. And, and you know what Satan told me? He said to me, Amiko, Amiko, Amiko. Nobody here knows you are a Christian. Nobody here knows you are a Christian. All the people who know you as a Christian, they are, they are far away in Nigeria. So enjoy yourself. Enjoy yourself. Nobody will find out. Nobody will find out. All the people that know you as a Christian, they are far away in Nigeria. Enjoy yourself. Nobody will find out. Friends, again, at such times, what you do with God on a regular basis from your heart, that is what will hold you up. That is what will influence and direct the way you will respond. Do you understand what I'm saying? That very thing I'm talking to you about is the number one thing in your life as a believer. You must protect it. You must nurture it. Your continuous surrender to God. 
your continuous commitment of your heart to the Lord. Your continuous commitment of your heart to the Lord. Apostle Paul said in Romans chapter 12 verse 1, he said, I beseech you therefore, brethren, that you present yourselves a living sacrifice. A living sacrifice. A living sacrifice. My dear friends, the thing that is at the core of Christianity is commitment. Our commitment from our hearts to the Lord. Unfortunately, not much is being said about it. And that's why the church is the way it is today. You hear about young ladies getting pregnant, men impregnating ladies and uh, helping them to abort it. Right? Ministers involved. You know why? Shallow commitment. Shallow commitment. When your heart is not committed to God, your flesh, your flesh will drive your life. Do you understand me? When your heart is not surrendered to him on a continuous basis, on, not my language, on a continuous basis, it's not a once and for all thing. It's not something you do in public. No. It's not something you do in public. It's a very private matter between you and your God. It's a private matter between you and your God. It's a private matter. Friends, when I started traveling to the United States in 1978, hmm, in those days, the day I will fly out of Lagos, I will leave Ibadan by 5.36 in the morning. By 8 o'clock, I'm at the door of the U.S. Embassy in Lagos. By 8.20, I am out with my visa. Then I go back to Ibadan, pack my load, come back to Lagos to fly that night. That is to tell you that there were not many people traveling at that time. Do you understand? By 1980, I came across a man by the name of Joel French. Joel French was a very well-connected, influential person in the United States of America. He said to me, Reverend Amico, we need men like you here. You said your wife is a medical doctor. Houston is the medical capital of the world. I need you to transfer your ministry over here. I need, we need men like you here. I'm going to settle your wife in her profession as a doctor. and You can continue your ministry here. We need men like you here. Friends, what an offer. What an offer. Offer. Huh? I wasn't looking for it. They were begging me with it. Friends, but you know what? A minister of the gospel, if you were called and sent, you are like a soldier posted to guard a particular building. You don't repost yourself unless you are reposted from Supreme Headquarters. Do you understand me? When you are a minister of the gospel, if you are called and sent with your assignment, you don't change your assignment by yourself because you did not send yourself. Do you understand me? You did not send yourself. Friends, Christianity is about living for God. Period. Not about my personal desires. Not about what I like. Not about what I will enjoy. Do you understand me? Now hear me. I'm not saying that you will not 
enjoy things as a believer. That's not what I'm saying. That's not what I'm saying. That's what I'm, I'm somebody, I like the good things of life. Do you understand me? I like the good things of life. I like to enjoy the good things of this life. Okay? But you know what? Even in that, God has the final say. Even in that, God has the final say. Friends, I wish I could spend, I wish I could spend the whole <laughs> evening on that because it is, it is such a crucial part of our walk, our Christianity. It's such, it's so crucial that that our hearts are established in, in these things. It's it's very crucial that our hearts are established in this thing. You must be somebody who is hungry for God. You must be somebody who is hungry. Apostle Paul, let's, let's look at Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. And let's look at the life of Apostle Paul. Let's look at Apostle Paul, Philippians chapter 3. Because of time, I will go from verse 7. I will go from verse 7. But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. What things were gained to me, those I counted loss loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and I do count them but dung. Why? So that I may win Christ. I count them but dung. So that I may win Christ. And be found in him not having my own righteousness which is of the law but that which is th through the faith of Christ. The righteousness which is of God by faith. That I may know him. That I may know him. And the power of his resurrection. And the fellowship of his sufferings. Being made conformable unto his death. If by any means I might attain to the resurrection of the dead. Verse 12. Not, I, not as though I had already attained. Either were already perfect or mature. But I follow after. I follow after that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. He's saying the, the reason why Jesus Christ apprehended me, I want to enter into the reality of that purpose. I want to enter into the reality of the purpose for which Christ apprehended me. Verse 13, brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. Look at the language in verse 14. I press, I press, I press towards the mark for the prize. I press. 
Using the language I press, that tells you it is not a movement that is without obstacles. When you press, that presupposes that you are pressing against obstacles. They are things that are trying to stop you. But you refuse to be stopped by those obstacles. You press. Pressing will not be convenient. Pressing will not be easy. But there is a goal you want to attain onto. And you will not allow any obstacle to stop you. Friends, that's the heart attitude of people that God will walk with in these last days. People that are hungry for God. People that are hungry. People that are hungry for God. And they will not allow anything. They will not allow anything to stop them. They will not allow anything to truncate their journey with God. My dear friends, can I tell you one hard truth that you don't hear about very much? Being a Christian, pursuing God, living for God will cost you something. Do you understand me? Living for God it will cost you. Apostle Paul said, the things that I counted dear, I had to forgo them in my pursuit of the excellency of the knowledge of God. I counted the excellency of the knowledge of Christ. I counted it of a much higher treasure. Something much more to be valued than all these other things I have already acquired. Friends, pursuing God will cost you something. Living for God will cost you something. It will cost you something. It will cost you something. There will be sacrifices. There will be sacrifices that you will make. There will be sacrifices. There will be things you will, you will lose. There will be things that you will lose because you want to live for God. There will, there will be things that you will lose. There will be things that you will lose because you want to live for God. I'm telling you this because hardly do you hear this type of preaching in Nigeria. And that's why the whole place is filled with people who go to church. But our society is still as corrupted as ever. Because there are people who are in church. But they are pursuing their own pleasures, their own desires. They're pursuing their own desires. And my dear friends, you know what? There's no sacrifice that you make for God that he will not turn around and reward you many, many times over. There's no sacrifice you will make for God for which he will not reward you many, many, many times over. But when it is time to make that sacrifice, he will call upon you to make that sacrifice. Friends, do you remember the story of Abraham and his son Isaac? Huh? God said to Abraham, your son, your only son that you love. As if God was trying to make the thing really tough. <laughs> Your son, your only son that you love, go and sacrifice him. Go and sacrifice him. Ah, 
Ah, friends, it doesn't make sense. Abi, it doesn't make sense. But you know what? If God said it, follow him. If God said it, follow him. If God said it, follow him. Leave the rest up to him. Do you understand me? Friends, May this year, first week of May this year, was 51 years I gave my life to Christ. 51 years. Don't clap, don't clap, don't clap. I'm not saying it to brag or to impress anybody. That's a fact of history. Right? 51 years. 51 years I gave my life to Christ. I've traveled this road for some time. And I can tell you, there is no sacrifice you make for God that he will not turn around in his own timing, <laughs> in his own timing, and reward you. Many times over. Many, many times over. God told Abraham, go and sacrifice your son. <laughs> God didn't mean for Abraham to go and kill his own child. No. But he had to present it to him that way. Go and sacrifice your son. I want to see what you will do. I want to see what you will do. I want to see what you will do. Go and sacrifice your son. <laughs> you see that issue, you can be on it for two weeks, three weeks. Because there are so many different dimensions to it. There are so many different dimensions to it. The book of Hebrews, the book of Hebrews tells us another angle to it. He said, when Abraham was tried by faith, by faith, Abraham <laughs> gave up his son, about whom it had been said that it is through Isaac that his seed will be called. God had given a word earlier through Isaac, your seed will be called. Now God comes around again, take this son, about whom I have told you before, that through him your seed will be called. Take him and go and sacrifice him. How now? Lord, how? But the Bible says, by faith, Abraham sacrificed him accounting that God was able also to raise him from the dead. From whence he had received him in the figure. In the eye of his heart, he had seen Isaac crucified, slaughtered and dead, and God put him back together to come to fulfill the original word. That's another seminar altogether. I don't want to go there. I don't want to go there. There's the aspect of the surrender. God asked Abraham, give up your Isaac. When he did, God said, because you have done this, because you have done this by myself, have I sworn, in blessing I will bless thee, in multiplying I will multiply thee, and in thy seed shall all the earth be blessed. God asked him to give up Abraham. When he did, God said, because you have done this, I am going to give my very best, Jesus Christ. He demanded Isaac, Abraham's best. When he did, God gave us his own best. Friends, every sacrifice God will demand for you to make, he will always pay you back. He will always pay you back. Friends, so I wish I had time to dwell on that. I am going to have to leave that. But there's a whole lot more I can say about that, but time will not permit me. Some other thing I want to tell you, to talk to you about very, very, very strongly. Friends, take time to develop a personal culture of faith. 
take time to develop a personal culture, lifestyle of faith. Take time to develop a personal culture, lifestyle of faith. If you don't do it, if you don't do it, life is going to be tough for you. Life is going to be hard for you. Take time to develop a personal culture, a solid personal lifestyle, culture of living by faith. A lot of people don't do that in church. Today, we gather in church. We gather in church. We sing, we shout, we do. But in your private corner, when problems come up, how do you respond? How do you respond in your private corner? How do you respond? We believers, we, we deceive ourselves <laughs> so much. What do I mean? I'm in a situation now where we, <laughs> we are um, a, a building that the architect designed for us in 2018, uh, she told us then it was going to cost 158 million to build a loan because it's on four floors. By last year, the same architect told me, <laughs> Reverend, 600 million. 600 million. By April this year, structural engineer was telling me, <laughs> Reverend, 1.5 billion. 1.5 billion. Okay. okay. And um, I was talking with uh, a brother, the, the engineer that we're supposed to work with for the construction. I told him, I said, what, see what they said. Oh. I know what he told me. You know what he told me? You know what he told me? He said to me, that is nothing for God. He said, that is nothing for God. He said so. Yeah? He said that because he is not the person responsible to produce the 1.5 billion. <laughs> because he is not the person <laughs> who is supposed to produce the 1.5 billion. That's why he said it is nothing for God. I'm saying that to tell you how we believers deceive ourselves. Thinking we are in faith. When another person is in trouble, you will say to the brother, believe God. God can do anything. Brother, believe God. Believe God. There is nothing impossible with God. Great preaching. When you are the person in trouble, then we will see what you really believe. Friends, I'm saying take time to develop a personal lifestyle, culture of faith. I don't mean this fake faith that is flying all over the place. There's a lot of fake faith. Fake. Fake People talk faith in church. But when you, it meets them in their private space, it's a different thing. Don't, 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 don't live your life on that foolish lifestyle. Take time to develop a solid personal culture of faith. Do you understand what I'm saying? I set up my ministry as a student in the University of Ibadan in November. 20, 1977. Yeah? By July, 
1978, a ministry that was not yet one year old. The ministry was not yet one year old. Nobody knew us. Nobody believed in us. Nobody was sending us money. But by brute force of faith, Cononia Ministries, that was not one year old, sponsored two flight tickets, two flight tickets for me and my partner to attend Kenneth Hagin's camp meeting in 1978. The flight ticket was 620 Naira. Lagos, John F. Kennedy Airport in New York, then Buffalo, New York, one hour flying from New York, 620 Naira. You know what life was like in Nigeria then? <laughs> But to put it in context for you, though, the two tickets, 1,240 naira, yeah? That was the cost of a brand new Volkswagen Beetle in Nigeria at the time. So that's to tell you it was not cheap money. It was not cheap money. Do you understand? It was not small money. It was good money. It was good money. God provided it. God provided it. And we went for Kenneth Hagin's camp meeting. Friends, my first camp meeting I attended, 1978. Yeah? I did not buy one shirt for myself. Because I wasn't in America to look for a shirt. That wasn't my agenda. I came back with tips. Tips. Books. That was my agenda. <laughs> that was my agenda. The word of God. I got back to Nigeria September, September 28th. No, September 27th or so. That's when I got back to Nigeria. You understand? And I uh, found out I was posted to do NYC in Kano. Okay? So I headed to Kano. I arrived orientation camp September 29th or so. Camp was to close. No, I arrived September 28th. Camp was to close September 30th. I arrived September 28th. So all the registration, all the primary posting and everything had taken place. And I was not there. All my unbeliever friends were you are, they looked at me, hey, Miko, it's just now you are coming. It's just now you are coming. I think you see this, your God, eh? See this, your God. You are going to, you are going to repeat NYC. All over. It's just now you are coming. I was laughing. So, as we went on in camp, a brother, a friend of mine, now called me. He said, oh boy, it's like you have a brother in this camp. It's like you have a brother in this camp. I saw one Peter Amoshuka on the list where people's names were put for primary assignment. Peter Amoshuka. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Peter Amoshuka is my first cousin. Okay? Peter Amoshuka studied agricultural economics, Kansas State University. Emiko Amoshuka studied agricultural economics, University of Ibadan, Nigeria. Okay? Follow the story? Peter Amoshuka came back to Nigeria, was posted to Kano State. Emiko Amoshuka was posted to Kano State. Follow the story? Amiko Amoshuka came in late for orientation camp, so was not registered, so could not be given any primary posting. Peter Amoshuka was given a double posting. First Bank of Nigeria, Ministry of Agriculture, Kano. So when I found out, I walked up to him. I said, oh boy, of the two, which one do you want? He said, First Bank. I said, okay. On Monday, I got dressed, showed up at Ministry of Agriculture. I said, I am Mr. Amoshuka. And work started.
Work started. Work started. No questions asked. No questions asked. Yeah? At the end of that year, during the last week, when they were doing passing out, parade and all that, yeah? I was in my house on Tarauni Road in Kano, and I was listening to one of the messages from last year's camp meeting, Kenneth Copeland. I was listening to the message, and at some point, Kenneth Copeland said something, and there was a spark of revelation in my spirit. And I said, you mean this type of meeting will be going on in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and I'll be here in Nigeria? I said, no, no, no. I began to scream in my room. In Kano, I began to scream. I said, no, no, no. I'm going to be in Tulsa, Oklahoma for the camp meeting. I'm going to be in Tulsa, Oklahoma for the camp meeting. I'm going to be in Tulsa. I was screaming in my room. Tarauni, <laughs> Zaria Road, I was screaming. I got dressed. I got dressed, okay? Got dressed. And I went to meet the state NYC commandant. I walked up to him. I said, sir, I need your help. I need your help, sir. I need your help. He said, what? He said, what? I said, sir, sir, there is a conference that will be taking place in Tulsa, Oklahoma in two weeks' time. Now, because I came late for orientation, I was supposed to stay back with the incoming set. Okay? To make up for that. Okay? Now, this was the last week for my set. So, I was supposed to stay back for the new sets to come in so that I do one month orientation with them. Right? But I had heard the word of God. The revelation had sparked off in my spirit. My head went wild. I went up to my state commandant. I said, sir, there's a conference that will be taking place in Tulsa, Oklahoma in two weeks' time. And different, different people that live in different, different parts of America are all going to be at that conference. And it is necessary, sir, that I am at that conference. It will save me the transport fare, flight fare, of going to meet them in different, different places. Sir, I need you to sign me off. I need you to sign me off. Was I crazy? <laughs> Was I crazy? The man looked at me. He said, what I'm about to tell you, don't tell anybody. Just go and wait. Let these people pass out. Come back and meet me. So I waited a day or two. I went back to him. He signed me off. <laughs> he signed me off. Friends, I can tell you story after story after story. 1979, I traveled with an excursion ticket. Okay? An excursion ticket is a discounted ticket. Discounted by about 35%. But it's valid for only six weeks. Okay? It's valid for only six weeks. If you stay beyond the six weeks, you have to pay the balance with a full, full fare ticket. Okay? So, as the six weeks were approaching, I still had a lot of things to do. I wasn't yet ready to come back home to Nigeria. But if I stayed back, I was going to have to pay an extra money. So, I sat down with myself. I held a conference with myself to find out if I could believe God for that extra money. I didn't just jump into it and then hope that things will turn out right. No, I sat down with myself to find out if I can believe God for the money. After that self-introspection, I decided I was going to stay back. I was, that I can believe God. I can believe God for it. I can believe God. I needed $250 extra. That was a lot of money for me at that time. That was a lot of money for me. Okay? So I stayed back. Bit went various places. I had a meeting with uh, Reverend Albert Willis in um, Lafayette, Louisiana. That... October, I had a meeting. I spoke at their morning session, their convention. After I finished my session, 
I was given my honorarium. I was given my honorarium. The check was for $494. I needed to pay $250. Yeah? Here I was with a check for $494. The devil jumped on my neck immediately. He said, you better go and buy your ticket. You better go and buy your ticket. Don't think it was your faith that produced it for you. You were just lucky. You were just lucky. You better go and buy your ticket. You better go and buy your ticket. Don't think it was your faith. You were just lucky. That's why I said, devil, is that what you are saying? Is that what you are saying? Okay, I am going to blow this money. I am going to blow this money down to zero. And we'll watch God replace it. So you know it is not luck. That is faith that produced it. So I went out to town and I just misbehaved. I went and bought me a, a, a Seiko digital chronometer. I just misbehaved. I squandered the money. Do you understand me? I squandered the money. Came down to zero. I came back to Houston. I was in Houston, actually. The late, the late John H. Osteen. We are the disciples of late John Osteen. The jewel we did there now for some of us to get us a bit. We don't understand. So, so, on Sunday morning, John Osteen said, if there's anybody who is trusting God for a financial miracle, come out now. I want to agree with you in faith. Guess who was number one to jump out? I was in trouble. <laughs> I was in trouble. So I jumped out. Because a couple of other people jumped out. He led all of us in a prayer of confession and um, finished. So as I turned my back to walk back to my seat, somebody tapped me on the shoulder. He said, come, 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 come. So I went with him. He handed me an envelope. He handed me an envelope. As he handed me an envelope, I went straight into the toilet. When you see, I'm about to tell you the secrets of preachers now. When a preacher goes into a toilet, he's going to check his offering. <laughs> So I went straight into the toilet and I checked the envelope. There was a check in there for $500. $500. I needed $250. Here was $500. So I said to the devil, can you see? Can you see now that it's not luck? Can you see that it's faith? And if you don't shut up your mouth, I'm going to blow this one again. If you don't shut up your mouth, I'm going to blow this one. And we'll watch God replace it. So that you know that it is not luck. Friends, I'm saying all of that for you to, for you to understand. Yeah? Faith is like a mechanic's tool. Faith, when a mechanic is working, when he needs number 10, plier, he knows it's number 10. He knows when he uses that, he knows what will be the effect. We ought to have a clear understanding of faith, how it works, and how to deploy it on purpose for it to produce the results we need. And friends, hear me. The world, we are in a very difficult phase of life now. Things are going to be extremely challenging in the years ahead. Isaiah chapter 60, verse 1, Arise and shine, for thy light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. Verse 2, Behold, darkness shall cover the earth, and gross darkness the people, but the Lord shall arise upon thee. Friends, there is a darkness that is going to come. There is a darkness, a darkness, Five years ago, I was recording in my friend's studio in Dallas. 
and I just, I just spoke out something. I said, I said, I said, the civilized world is going to face un unimaginable levels of chaos and turbulence in the next couple of years, economically, politically, and socially. I said the developed world, the very thing that the developed world had leaned upon for sustenance is going to prove on what they had leaned on will collapse, will fail them. Because the book of Hebrews, chapter 12, I was preaching from, God said, once more, I will shake, not the earth only, but the heavens also, that only the things that cannot be shaken may remain. Friends, I said, the things that the civilized world had developed that made them point their face, hand at God, to say, look what we've developed. Where is God? There is no God. Those very things they have developed, that they put their confidence in, those things are going to fail them. It's going to collapse. I just said that. I didn't make any much about it. During the coronavirus, 2020 or 2021, somebody saw that video and sent it to my friend in Ibadan. Not knowing who was my best friend, he sent it to. He sent it to me. When I played it, friends, I was scared. Is this what I, is this what I said? I said, please, don't share this to anybody. I don't want them to come and lynch me. Friends, as I have watched things since that time, I am more convinced. A few days ago, I was listening to CNN in American politics, and they were talking about people not accepting election results. I said, is this Africa? Is this Africa? You know what happened with the elections in 2020? All the riots that took place. Look what has happened in Britain. They have had to change prime ministers within how many weeks? Boris Johnson, Liz Trust, within a matter of how many weeks? Friends, this world is going into the, 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 the sudden increase in prices in the developed world. Electricity that people were paying uh, 300 pounds for suddenly rose to 800 pounds suddenly rose to 2,000-something pounds within a matter of a few months. Friends, challenging times are coming. Madman Putin has the whole world on their toes now. In my adult life, and I have followed international diplomacy since 1967, avidly, I've never, there's never been any world leader that threatened to use the nuclear bomb only that mad fellow. That's where the world is now. There will be darkness. But that darkness is not for the believer. Verse 1, God said, arise, shine. Your light is come. The glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. Verse 2, darkness shall cover the earth and gross darkness. But the Lord shall arise upon thee. That darkness is not for you. But you know what? The darkness is going to threaten everybody. The darkness is going to threaten everybody. You know why? We all go to the same markets. We all use the same banks. Do you understand what I'm saying? There are no special banks for believers. There are no special markets for believers. We all are in the same world. But as it happened in Egypt... Okay? Darkness was over Egypt. Light was over Goshen. At that time, it was easy because they were both geographically separated. Do you understand me? God could put darkness over Egypt because it was a separate geographical entity and light over Goshen because it was a separate geographical entity. But in this hour, it's not so. The darkness is going to threaten everybody. But those who have taken their time to develop their walk with God and their walk of faith, with their faith, they will press through the darkness 
and they will come out in the glory. That is something you must train yourself to do. And may I say this, because you have a good job that pays you good money today, don't think, ah, I'm okay, I'm okay. <laughs> Friends, do you know how many thriving businesses suddenly collapsed as a result of coronavirus? Do you know how many businesses, booming businesses, suddenly collapsed? There will be unimaginable chaos that no man can explain. Only your roots in God will take you through it. Take time to develop a solid personal culture of faith. And that is not an easy job to do. You must continually feed yourself on revealed knowledge. You must continually feed yourself on revealed knowledge. There are men whom God has set in the body. Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers for the maturing of the saints. You must expose yourself to the ministries of such men. Don't turn your pastor into your God. Your pastor will not have everything you need to grow as a believer. God does not put everything into the hands of one man. God built a body. He put different giftings into different people for all of us to feed from all of these different giftings. Make yourself to avail yourself of those things. Kenneth E. Hagin, Fred Price, Kenneth Copeland, Jerry Savell, and people in that flow. Make, pursue their materials. Feed, reveal knowledge. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9. I have not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love him. Verse 10. But he had revealed them unto us by his spirit. Friends, this wonderful package of benefits which I have not seen, that ear have not heard, that has not entered into the heart of, of man. The primary way by which you will access it is by the revelation of the Holy Spirit. You must be somebody who, whose life is constantly flooded with revealed knowledge. That means don't just read the Bible, meditate. It is the process of meditation that transforms the written word into the living word. It is through, through the process of meditation that the written word becomes the living word. You must spend time. And friends, what I'll say last on that, a lot of you in our younger generation, there's one thing you are doing to yourself that is going to be spiritually injurious to you. What do I mean? For some reason, you think that there is some, some, some fun out in the world you don't want to miss out from. So, you want to play for the world. At the same time, you want to be a Christian. Friends, you cannot be a friend of the world and a friend of God at the same time. It won't work. Did you hear what I said? You cannot be a friend of the world and a friend of God at the same time. Because God and the world, they are sworn enemies. You cannot be a, a, a friend of my enemy and be my friend. Are you following me? The Bible tells us to come out from amongst them. It's not everything the world offers that you absorb. Are you following me? A lot of our younger people, they, they expose themselves so much to the wrong things in social media all through the week. By the time they come into church on Sunday, the word of God that they hear is sitting on top of a dense concentration of the wrong thing. So the word of God has a big problem to penetrate through that dense concentration of the wrong thing. 
Friends, it's not everything the world has to offer that I expose myself to. Do you understand me? The man called Michael Jackson. Huh? The man called Michael Jackson. The time my eyes fell on him was after he had died. When he became a news item. That was when my eyes fell on him for the first time. You know why? Michael Jackson could never be a part of my entertainment. You say, uh, uh, old school. I'm very old school, though. I'm very old school. But me and God are very good friends. Me and God, we are very good friends. Are you following me? We are very good friends. Friends, you need to watch what you expose your mind to. You need to watch it. You need to watch what you expose your mind to. I use this illustration many times. When you eat one slice of bread, right? You eat one slice of bread that you coated with peanut butter, right? One slice, but you coated it with peanut butter. You ate it. And after you have eaten it, 30 minutes later, they tell you dinner is ready. What will you say? You say, I am not hungry. Right? All you ate was one slice. One slice is not enough to fill you up. But the one slice was coated with something that destroys your appetite for food. The peanut butter or the margarine, the fat in it, dampens your appetite for food. Friends, there are certain things you expose yourself to that will destroy your appetite for God. There are certain things you expose yourself to that will destroy your appetite for God. The Bible tells you, he that will be a friend of the world, the enmity with God. The world and God are not friends. I'm not saying don't uh, wear nice clothes. Oh. That's not what I'm saying. That's not what I'm saying. If you come close to me now, you will smell some nice cologne on me. Good smelling cologne. Friends, I beg you all even, please. Anybody who does not wear one fragrance or the other, if you don't use one fragrance or the other, may I prophesy to you, you are a major distributor of bad body odor. If you don't use one form of fragrance or the other, you understand what I'm saying? And I've been asking the question all these years, what is the spirituality in stinking? What is spiritual about stinking? Somebody answer my question, please. So I'm saying, in saying all of this, I'm not saying don't use the nice things of life. No, no, no. That's what I'm saying. But you must approach it with a spiritual heart. Last thing I will tell you about, I cannot spend much time on it. I, will, I wish I could. Develop a lifestyle of agape love. Develop a lifestyle of agape love. Agape, agape. Agape. What is agape? Look at 1 Corinthians 13 and you will see agape. Read 1 Corinthians 13 and use it to judge yourself all the time. Do you understand me? Friends, people will offend you. People will offend you in life. Guaranteed. Do you understand me? People will offend you. I went to preach for a minister friend of mine many, many years ago. We finished preaching Sunday morning. I was staying in his house. After we had lunch, I had siesta. We were relaxing, watching television in the evening. And one of his members, who is heavily loaded with money, came by visiting. 
And he took an interest in me because he heard my preaching that morning, Sunday morning. He wanted to take my address in Ibadan, my phone number, my address. And my friend, the host, got jittery. Ah, if this my wealthy millionaire, if he begins to relate with Reverend Amico, some of the money that should have been coming to church will now be going to him, right? So you know what my friend said to him? He said, to Reverend Amico, he's not a pastor, he's not a pastor, you know. He's just a general laborer in the kingdom. He's just a general laborer. He thought he needed to put me down so that that guy, do you know what? Till tomorrow, I have not raised that issue with my friend. People will offend you. You must train yourself to overlook the offenses. Do not carry offenses in your heart. Don't carry offenses. My very close friend, we were chatting recently. He told me that um, a certain minister, when he was celebrating his 70th birthday, he wrote them to, to write a tribute, to send some tribute, and they did not send any tribute. Now, those people are celebrating their own anniversary and they have approached him to write something and he will not write it. I, I said, my brother, why? Uh, he said, he said, no, I, I, I cannot. Oh, I, friends, people will offend you. Do you understand me? People will offend you, but we must not carry offenses in our hearts. When you do, offenses that you carry, when you allow yourself to, to live in something that does not honor God, you are eroding the spiritual foundations of your life. You must walk in agape love. That means you must not try to put down another person in order for you to rise. Don't do that. Don't do it. Live a very ordinary life. You must love the brethren. For me, I treasure the fellowship of the community of faith. I love the people of God. I live a very ordinary life. I live a very ordinary village life. I live a village type of life. I wear shorts most of the time, shorts and my t-shirt. That's how I'm dressed most of the time. I live a very ordinary life. I'm not in competition with anybody. I've announced over and over to all the preachers in Nigeria, I am the lowest. I'm, the, I'm at the bottom. I refuse to join the rat race. I refuse to join the rat race. I tell I'm at the bottom. And all you guys who are on top, when you fall, you'll come to meet me at the bottom. My blood pressure at 71, my blood pressure is the blood pressure of a 40-year-old man. Because I'm not in competition with anybody. People offend me, but I, I pass over it. Friends, there's a whole lot more that I should say that I cannot say. I'm sure I have gone beyond my time allocated. Bulu will never invite me again. <laughs> but if you pray for me, God will forgive me. There's a lot more I can say, but time will not. But please take these things to heart. Take them to heart. They are very simple, ordinary things. But if you will retain these things, that is part of what has kept me going for 51 years. Hunger for God. Hunger for God. Surrender to God. I told you that surrender will direct the way you do everything in your life. Lord, I ask you to breathe upon every word spoken. Breathe upon every word spoken. Breathe upon every word spoken. Speak to us beyond what a man can do. Minister to us, O oh God. Let your name be glorified. Thank you, precious Father. We worship and adore you. In Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. This bully is always dobalaying for me. I hope God will cure him of dobalaying someday. 
There are some of my books that I brought, but unfortunately, they were shipped from Podakot by GIGL. It says GIGL has notified him <laughs> that they are in Ikpaja. I don't need them in Ikpaja, I need them here. They're entitled Knowing God and How to Receive a Miracle from God. They talk more than what I have shared with you here today. I don't know how Bolu is going to arrange for you to get a hold of them, but please, with everything in my heart, I beg you, get a hold of those books. Not only get them, read them. And uh, God will use them greatly in your life. Thank you very much for your patience. Appreciate your time. I've gone way beyond my time, but you've stood here with me all the way. Thank you. God bless you.